Russell T. Davis is taking over Doctor Who again for the next series. We don't know anything yet. We don't know how this is going to go. We don't know who the Doctor is, who the companion is. Not a niche. Zilch. However, if, like me, you spent the last 16 years watching RTD's episodes of Doctor Who and repeat, you may be a little more familiar than most with where the inspiration for those Doctors came from. And perhaps this can tell us something about what the future holds. Casting the Doctor has never been simple. When the show started, regeneration wasn't part of the plan, but when the first Doctor, William Hartnell, left the show, the Doctor went through a renewal, which I think to audiences in 1966 might have seemed more like growing younger than changing into an entirely new person. The third Doctor was probably a bigger game changer in terms of the Doctor's characterization. Before then, he was a wacky mad scientist, but the third Doctor was tall and debonair. He knew martial arts and loved cars. He was more of a James Bond type than anything else. This massive change was due to a shift in the format of the show. The Doctor now lived on Earth and worked with UNIT to protect humanity. The fourth Doctor changed that up again as a sort of chaotic bohemian who couldn't care less about the life the third Doctor had built on Earth. You should be glad to be going home. The Earth isn't my home, Sarah. That time I found something better to do than run round after the Brigadier. And that matched his era of the show where he returned to his former lifestyle as a traveller. So creating a new Doctor isn't simple. It's not a matter of just casting the right person, it's also a matter of figuring out the characterization and how that impacts the story that the writers want to tell. In 2003, Davis's show The Second Coming was broadcast on ITV. The show starred Christopher Eccleston as the Second Coming of Christ. Instead of the enlightened, posh, old-fashioned version of Christ you might have imagined the Second Coming would be, Davis imagines Jesus as an average bloke from the North. Steve is just an ordinary guy, no one special, the kind of dork women laugh at when he tries to ask them out, until one day he suddenly realises, oh, he, he's the son of God, whoops. He can't contain all the information of omniscience at once because he has just a mortal body, so it downloads a little bit at a time. I thought the son of God knew everything. Tiny little brain, it's like, I can't hold it all in the head, like the all the divinity, it's like a... It's like it downloads a bit at a time. Once that download begins, Steve starts to truly see the beauty in all life of, of rain, of food, of sound. To be human is the most wonderful thing in all of creation. I like this idea that the modern version of Christ would be this kind of humble, unnoticeable figure who works in a video shop. He's not larger than life, he's not glorified, he's not the most gorgeous man in the room, he's just a bloke. The Second Coming is a really interesting show which utilises Christian mythology to tell a very atheist story. Davis is an atheist himself. They expected a ton of backlash because of the topic, but they didn't get much, probably because, Davis reckons, they didn't use any religious iconography. That kind of blows my mind a little bit, the idea that we can get away with so much more by just avoiding the images and just using the words. When Davis was asked to take over Doctor Who, he called Christopher Eccleston and had the actor practically reprise his role. There have always been ways to see the Doctor as an allegory for Christ, but otherwise he's been pretty different from Steve the Second Coming. The Doctor is usually pretty posh, well-dressed, if, well, by some standards. He comes across as a man of learning, he's a scientist of the upper class, he rubs shoulders with politicians, plays cricket, he's an aristocrat. With the Ninth Doctor, Davis threw all of that out the window. This Doctor's average blokiness is part of the charm. It's how he engages with the world around him. He feels like a member of the working class. He'll have a pint with you and explain rocket science using a packet of peanuts as a metaphor. He doesn't travel in some fancy TARDIS all squeaky clean and looking like a university library. His TARDIS is busted, I mean busted. Busted. To me, this TARDIS looks as if the white plastic all fell off and whatever was inside the walls just kept growing on its own. A wild TARDIS. He bought it used of his ex-girlfriend's brother for 200 quid and a packet of cigarettes. But she runs alright. She breaks down sometimes and doesn't always get where you want to go, but it's the journey that counts. And there are wonders to see all along the way. The Ninth Doctor also speaks with a northern accent. If you are an alien, how comes you sound like you're from the north? Lots of planets have a north. Traditionally, the Doctor speaks with a very posh accent, usually received pronunciation, though briefly with a Scottish accent for the Seventh Doctor's era. In fact, back when it all started in the 60s, everyone had to speak with an RP accent. Good day to you. They tried to bring on a companion, Dodo, who spoke with a common accent, but the BBC nixed it and forced the character to change her accent. My dear child, if you're going to be with us for any length of time, you'll have to do something about that English of yours. What's wrong with it? Pretty terrible, child. Oh, it's most irritating. 
<laughs> Davis chose to keep Eccleston's normal accent for Doctor Who, which he'd also used in The Second Coming, which imagined the second coming of Christ occurring in Manchester. This definitely lends to this Doctor's personality and strips away the upper-class impression given by earlier Doctors. The series really changed the vision of the Doctor from someone who came from privilege, sometime president of the Time Lords, to someone a little more relatable to the average viewer. You could be mates. I want chips. Me too. Right then, before you get me back in that box, chips it is and you can pay. Not money. And in fact, class is a theme which resonates through the series. Rose is working class, living in a council estate with her mum, and often finds herself engaging with other working class women throughout time and space. Capitalism and greedy politicians are villains, and evil company pits workers against one another to distract from the real monster. But of course in the end, topping off parallels with Christ, the Doctor must ultimately sacrifice himself, and is, in a sense resurrected. In 2005, the same year Eccleston took over as the Ninth Doctor, Davis' series Casanova was broadcast starring David Tennant as the eponymous hero, with Peter O'Toole playing the older version of the character. The show was inspired by the real life of Casanova, though in many ways the Tennant version is much less of a piece of shit than the real deal was. Like Eccleston, you'll recognise this guy's accent. With the exception of all the naked f***ing, Casanova feels incredibly Doctor Who-like, right down to the music composed by Murray Gold, who would take over as Doctor Who composer for over a decade beginning with Davis's run. Casanova himself has a very Doctor-like attitude of walk about like you own the place and you'll figure it out. He's a bit of a genius and becomes a jack of all trades, so his adventures take him all over the place. David Tennant is probably not quite the type most people would cast as Casanova. The same year a Hollywood film saw Heath Ledger star as Casanova. I feel like an American version starring a hunky square jawed dude and a British version starring a lanky dork are very on brand for both countries. <laughs> God, the American film is terrible. If you want to watch a film that's a good example of really rubbish feminism, check it out for sure. David Tennant's not the suave, sexy stereotype of Casanova. He's a ladies' man in that he respects women. He listens to them and understands them. He doesn't conquer them. They're not conquests. They're each love interests to him. When Tennant took over the role of the Doctor from Eccleston, he retained his accent from Casanova, which is mayhaps more noticeable because unlike with Eccleston, this is not Tennant's real accent, he's from Scotland. The Ninth Doctor sounded like he was from the north of England and now he's regenerated, he suddenly sounds like he's from London. How does that work? There's a line apparently cut from the first episode which suggests that his accent has changed because of his companion Rose, influenced by her accent. Part of me thinks the real life reason was because the accent worked really well as the cheeky sexy Casanova. Not that the Scottish accent isn't sexy, it's hard to avoid the fact that David Tennant is an objectively sexy person. Are we in Scotland? But I think there's a boyish cheekiness to his English accent? I don't know, that's just my theory. Unlike the Ninth Doctor who was occasionally mildly flirtatious but really didn't have anything romantic or particularly sexy going on, the Tenth Doctor fucks. The Ninth Doctor never outright flirted with Rose, and any hints that they might have romantic feelings for each other were pretty awkward for the pair of them. Is this a sexual relationship? No. no. We're not a couple. Why does everyone think we're a couple? But the Tenth Doctor feels like he was made for Rose. He's the ideal Rose Tyler boyfriend. I think the flirtatiousness between them may be more common in Davis's writing than other writers. Moffat's Tenth Doctor is a little bit more awkward about sexuality, whereas Davis... Am I funny? Am I sarcastic? Sexy? Got married! That was a mistake. Good Queen Bess. And let me tell you, her nickname is no longer... Although the Eighth Doctor was officially the first one to get a kiss on screen, it was pretty awkward and pretty unsexy. The Tenth Doctor made the character a sex symbol, and that was carried over to the Eleventh Doctor for sure when Stephen Moffat took over. Whether or not this would have happened without Tennant on the Casanova series, I don't know, and whether you find Tom Baker to be a sex symbol is, you know, that's, that's your business. But the Tenth Doctor, in all his Casanova-esque glory, opened the door to adorable, sexy doctors, and the world said yes! Please, give us more. When the Tenth Doctor first gets out of his pyjamas, we actually see him consider a jacket very similar to the one he wore as Casanova. I also feel like Captain Jack might have been influenced by this version of Casanova, whose first name is Giacomo, but is frequently shortened in the show to Jack. While speaking of the Tenth Doctor, I want to take it back to the second coming for a moment. Spoiler warning. 
the characters come to the decision that for the world to move on, humanity needs to grow up and start taking responsibility for ourselves. And this means God needs to die. This scene heavily echoes the end of the Tenth Doctor's life. In his penultimate story, the Tenth Doctor goes a bit power mad and starts taking liberties with changing history that he never has before. No one should have that much power. Tough. This is echoed in The Second Coming. I can do what I want. When it's finally time for the Tenth Doctor to move on, to regenerate, to, to end his own life, after he said goodbye to all of his companions, everyone who was important to him in this life with this body, I remember thinking, he's ready. He's going to say now that he's ready. I don't want to go. A similar sentiment is expressed by Steve in his final moments in The Second Coming. Don't want to. Don't say that. I want to stay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So what does all this tell us about the future of Doctor Who? Well, I would imagine at this point, it would be fair to look at Davis's more recent work and think about who he might steal from another show and transplant into Doctor Who the way he did with the 10th and 9th Doctors. Years and Years is probably the closest thing to a sci-fi show he's done since leaving Doctor Who, starring Russell Tovey, who previously appeared in Doctor Who as Alonzo Frame. I know that Davis definitely really likes this actor, but... I don't think he quite works. For one thing, the character doesn't really translate in the same way Christ and Casanova did. These guys were kind of magical and powerful and were envisioned to feel that way. Secondly, he's another white guy. I don't think Davis would be totally opposed to this, especially if it's a gay actor. I mean, imagine the first gay actor for the Doctor. But on the other hand, a few years ago, Davis novelized his first Doctor Who episode, Rose. In this episode, she's shown a picture of the Doctor by basically a fan. In the novel, she's shown pictures of all the Doctors all the way up to the 13th Doctor and beyond. The next Doctor, after Jodie Whittaker, in Davis's vision, was a tall black woman, followed by an androgynous person. This makes me wonder if he might consider Tania Miller as the Doctor, based on the description. She's an incredible actor, one I'd love to see in the role. I think she'd bring an unbelievable presence to the character. Though again, her character in Years and Years doesn't quite fit that epic protagonist role we saw in Christ in Casanova. I can still kind of see it. I mean, she'd be perfect, wouldn't she? She would just, she would be phenomenal. The most Doctorish character in this show was Edith, played by Jessica Hines, who is a radical activist whose family kind of resents her because she seems to prioritise activism over the family. If the Doctor were in this show, this would be her. And Jessica Hines is amazing, she would be a brilliant Doctor. I think of all the characters he's written in recent years, this is the closest he's come to writing a Doctor character. More recently, Davis released It's a Sin, the story of a group of friends living in the 1980s at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. The show follows almost invariably gay men, with the only real exception being the character Jill, played by Lydia West. I think West is a major contender for the Doctor. Jill, based on a real-life friend of Davis's, fits in comfortably with the gay male community. All her friends are gay, they live together, their life is very gay. Except Jill never dates anyone. All the guys are constantly hooking up, and she doesn't. She is outgoing and talented. She's an actor and a singer. She might not have the most successful future ahead of her, but she'll get by happily. When HIV starts to creep into their lives, Jill ends up taking care of the community. She learns about HIV, she helps people out, she becomes an activist, she's incredible, she's selfless. And then in the last episode, someone asks her, where's your boyfriend then? What about you? And you realise Jill never even considered looking after herself. She puts everyone else first, and that's the point. That's Jill's happily ever after. This idea of a character who is incapable of putting herself first feels very Doctorish to me. I can see how she could be easily translated into the Doctor. The other big rumour is that Ollie Alexander, who played Richie in It's a Sin, might be up for the role. I... I can't quite see it, personally. I don't think the character Richie works as a Doctorish character, and I'm not quite sure it's something Alexander can pull off. But maybe it would be a whole new type of Doctor. Though I think the key to the Doctor is that an actor can play him as both very young and very old. So I guess only time will tell if Alexander can pull that off. I'm also going to throw the name Cyril Nri out there. Because although his character in Davis's Cucumber also doesn't have a good Doctorish vibe, I can just see him piloting the TARDIS. It's just an image in my mind that feels 
very real, almost like a traditional doctor. What about companions? I can definitely see Lydia West and Ollie Alexander as companions, no doubt about that in my mind. They both have a beautiful, youthful energy which I think fits the role of the companions really well. But then again, I think Davis's era actually changed the role of the companions somewhat. Instead of sitting back and letting the Doctor always be the hero, Davis' companions' journeys were about becoming like the Doctor, learning over the course of a season or two, and finally being able to be that person who makes the choice which saves the day. That open-mindedness changed how we envision companions in the show to this day. I wouldn't be surprised if he continues to shake up the show's format in other ways. Dare I also imagine Ben Wishaw from Davis's a very English scandal? Is that pushing it? Surely if the next Doctor is a white dude, it will at least be a gay white dude. Whatever happens, I'm thrilled that Davis is back. I had no idea when I was working on my last video till the very last moment that he was coming back. It was a total coincidence that I was working on that video. I'm really looking forward to it. I've kind of fallen out of love with the show in the last decade, so I'm pretty hopeful that this is the beginning of a renewed romance for me. Thanks for watching. If you like my videos and you want to help support my work, please consider helping me out via Patreon and getting exclusive Patreon content. Also, I hit 50,000 subscribers, which is incredible. Thank you so much. I can't believe it. Like, Wow. Thank you to all my patrons and an extra, extra special thanks to Kat R, Danny Aidenstone, Justin DeLima, Mathete, Siobhan, Tasha Heim, The Bipan Library, The Digital Witch, Aaron, AJ, Amelia D, Apathetic Gaiety, Eric Parkinson, B, Beslaff, Ben Hengst, Beth Hershey, Bipartisan, Break Every Yoke, Charis Edwards, Deanna McMillan, Dweebin, ES, Erie NB, Elsie Astro, Emery James Fairgreave, Evergarden Wall, Fafa Elania, Felixer of Life, Gavin Salmon, Hackney Deditz, Hilda Mangold, Jam Kwasowski, Jamie Pope, Jessage, Juicy Fantasy Queen Plant Hookups, Jules, Juliana C, Julius, Kale, Kate and Jess, Kim Y, Kisa, Lacey Cox, Lillian Brink, Lord Asriel, Marla, McKenning Wood, Miss Mad, Miriam McGlynn, Nico, Nick Snary, Nina, Octo, Oddbjorn the Frizzy, Olive, Peach, Pregnant Seinfeld, Queer Aesthetic, Rebecca Peacock, Renderly, River Haddock, Rock the Shell, Ryan Peters, Saint Laura, Samson Lopez, Sarah R, Savrad Musin, Sawyer Donk, Shaved Headed By, She Algorithm, Sithvich, Soy, Spaghetti Rabbit, Steve, Straw Fox, Susie S, Svipal the Trans Boy Valkyrie, The Children of Jack Acid, Tia Till, Tina Gigya, Troy Zayer, Verlux, Vince Whitaker, Will O'Connor, and Wisdom Teeth. Thanks, my darlings, and I'll see you next time.